Hello from the National Archives Public Programs and Education staff. My name is Sarah Lyons Davis, and I'm an education specialist at the National Archives in New York City. Welcome to the National Archives Comes Alive Young Learners Program. Today, we meet Matthew Henson, portrayed by actor and storyteller Keith Henley of the American Historical Theater. Matthew Henson was an African-American explorer who helped Admiral Robert Perry reach the North Pole in April 1909. He actually accompanied Perry on seven trips to the North Pole region over a 20 year span. Henson learned the Inuit language, built sleds, trained dog teams, and many other jobs on the expeditions. Henson was the first person to reach the pole and responsible for planting the American flag. The National Archives has a number of records related to these Arctic expeditions, including this one of Henson. You see him wearing his fur parka to help combat the extreme cold conditions found in the Arctic. The 1909 expedition was documented in letters, photos, and sketches. Here we have a photograph of the Robert Perry sledge party posing with flags at the North Pole. You can see Henson right in the middle, planting the polar flag at the North Pole. This image and educational activity can be found on docsteach.org. And we'll share this image again at the end of the program. If you have a question for Matthew Henson, please send it to us via the YouTube chat box and we'll try and answer it at the end of the program. National Archive staff monitors the chat box. And please feel free to let us know where you're watching from today. Our programs are brought to you from the National Archives Public Programs and Education Team and the National Archives Foundation. You can find information for teacher and student programs on the National Archives website, that's archives.gov, under Educator Resources or learn about upcoming programs under Attend an Event and on the National Archives Facebook page. And now, let us give a warm welcome to Matthew Henson. Wow. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, I am actually sitting a little, it's kind of warm where I am, a lot warmer than I would be if I was in Greenland wearing this beautiful coat. <laughs> Basically, we would only wear a coat of this magnitude if it was, oh boy, up and towards the North Pole. It's almost 60 degrees below zero. You can imagine how cold that is. Uh, and it was absolutely uh, frigid. It was very frigid. And, uh, but I, I, I'll share, um, <laughs> share some very interesting stories about being at the top of the world. Just imagine standing on the top of the world. It's just absolutely mind boggling. I can't believe that I actually made it to the top of the world. A poor black man from Maryland standing on the top of the world. Well, let me share, let me, let me, let me start at the beginning and give you an idea of how I got to be, uh, made that particular, um, became that successful. Well, I was about, oh, let's say, oh, I was 11 years old when I decided to leave home. Uh, my mother died when I was very young. My father died when I was nine years old. And of course, after my mother died, he had remarried. My stepmother and I did not get along at all. So uh, I did what most young men, regardless of race or creed, uh, we did a very popular thing. We ran. We're always running. So uh, get used to it because I did it a couple times. So I decided to leave home uh, in Maryland and I ended up walking about 50 miles to Washington, D.C. And I lived with my uncle. Now, my uncle had ideas and his idea was for me to go to school and to make something of myself. I wasn't feeling that at all. Uh, I, I didn't see the need for me to go to school and besides, at 11 years old, I had a lot of adventure in my spirit. I was like, I want to go do something exciting, something wonderful, something that will, I don't know, but I know I didn't want to sit at, sit in school and, and learn and 
I just wanted to do something. I didn't know what it was. So when my uncle wasn't paying attention, I ran away. That's the second time. And, <laughs> and I ended up on the outskirts of Maryland, uh, the border of Maryland and Washington, D.C. And I ended up working at this CD pub uh, that was owned by this woman called Aunt Janie. And oh, my God. Was she a who? Oh my lord! I had so much fun working at her uh, establishment. Uh, I learned how to cook and clean and wash dishes and wait on tables and all that. And that, 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 of course, that would be the ideal thing to do. But the most exciting thing was the people that came in to visit her pub. Wow! Oh, so many wonderful, hilarious characters. But the main one was Baltimore Jack. Whoa! Baltimore Jack had it influenced my life, you would not believe. Every time he would come, he would sit and tell me of the various adventures and things that he did. You see, Baltimore Jack was the captain of his own ship, and he sailed the world and did whatever he wanted, go wherever he wanted to go. And he would come back. Every time he would go out, he would come back and share those stories with me. And I was like, yeah. That's what I want to do. That is so, oh, yes, I want to do that. I want to do that. So I went, uh, so after one day I went and told Aunt Janie, I said, Aunt Janie, guess what? I want to be the captain of my own ship and I'm going to sail the world. Yes, that's what I want to do. Well, Aunt Janie sat me down and she says, um, Matt, I don't think that's a wise decision. You see, there are not too many Black men who are capable to own their own ship, let alone sail the world. Uh, so I, I think the best thing for you to do is to uh, go back to school, go live with your uncle, go back to school, get an education, and Make something and say, ah, nope, 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 that's not what I want to do. That's not what I'm going to do. I am determined. I am going to be the captain of my own ship, and I am going to sail the world. Well, around 12, 13 years old, um, I guess if I'm going to sail the world and be the captain of my ship, I guess I need to go learn how to sail. <laughs> so what did I do? I ran away. That's number three. I ran away, and I walked. 60 miles to Baltimore. Well, when I get to Baltimore, I the first ship I came to was the Katie Hines. And the gentleman who was the captain was Captain Childs. Oh, what a wonderful man he was. He was absolutely the best. And I was this really small, scrawny little black boy. And he was looking for a cabin boy. And he took me in taught me everything I needed to learn about sailing. And uh, I became very proficient in every aspect of sailing. I could, it, not only the cooking and cleaning, but I could uh, build anything. I became a, a, a remarkable carpenter. I could make nets, I could um, mend them. I, the sails, there was nothing that I could not do. Absolutely nothing. Well, I stayed on the Katie Hines for about eight years and uh, Captain Childs died. And when he died, there was really nothing that was going to keep me uh, on the continue to sail, especially with that crew. I had a lot of problems with that crew, but I'll explain, I'll explain that a little later on. Uh, so I decided that I will not be the captain of my own ship, but I did sail the world. I did sail the world, but I just won't be a captain. So I decided to find something else to do. And I ended up working in New York City, um, in Washington, excuse me, in Washington, in a men's head shop. A gentleman by the name of Robert Perry, at this time he was a lieutenant, he comes into the store looking for a, um, a cabin boy. Now he talks to the owner, I'm in the back. He talks to the owner, and the owner thought of me. And uh, so he introduced us. Now, I'm a little too old to be a cabin boy. I'm 20 years old. I'm a little 
about 20, 21 years old. I'm, I'm too old to be a cabin boy and I'm too experienced. And when Mr. Perry began to explain to me what he wanted, I told him what I was capable of doing. And instead of him making me a member of his crew, he needed a cabin boy. And like most white men back in those days, they didn't believe that black men had or that I had that type of experience. But I saw something in his eyes that was different than the others. It actually reminded me of Captain Childs. So I trusted him and I decided to go ahead and be his cabin boy. Well, we get to Nicaragua. Oh, and the reason why we were, uh, we go, we went to Nicaragua was because uh, at that time the country was looking for a place to build a canal and they were surveying various uh, ports and Nicaragua was one of those ports. So there we are in Nicaragua and one of his crewmen had gotten hurt while they were out. And I saw him, I grabbed my gear and my first aid kit and I go tend to his needs. And then I pick up where he left off and uh, finish the job. Well, Robert Perry is standing on, on the side and he's sitting there going, wow, he really can do everything he said he can do. It's amazing. And then he goes, you know what? That's the man that's going to take me to the North Pole. Well, as the story goes, we ended up going to uh, Greenland, trying to make our way to uh, the North Pole. And the year was, uh, at that time, it was like 1891. So here we are on our way to uh, Greenland. Uh, we're going to, we're heading into McCormick Bay. Oh, let me tell you, when we were coming into McCormick Bay, it was the most beautiful sight I had ever seen. Oh, the snow-capped mountains and the greenery. Uh, it, at that, it was like our springtime and there was beautiful flowers. Oh, it was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. It was absolutely breathtaking. Oh, was that? Greenland is beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And uh, so, Robert Perry brought his wife on our first expedition. And uh, so all of us are out on the deck and we're all watching this amazing, amazing view of Greenland. And the ship gets caught in the ice and it jolts. And you'll never guess what happened. Robert Perry falls and breaks his leg. He broke his leg. Can you imagine he breaks his leg before we even get started? So while they're mending tended to his knees, myself and several members of the crew were out there chipping at the ice and we uh, get, the, get the ship uh, free and then we make it into port. Well, once we get there, I, the, the, once we get there, this is the most exciting part of this whole story about my life, is that uh, so we get to the port and everyone comes off the ship. And of course, the, the natives, the Inuits, please do not call them Eskimos. They're Inuits. The Inuits are excited. Well, they're not really excited because they've seen European men come off the ship. Ships come every now, every so often. So they're very used to seeing uh, a lot of white men coming off the ship. But when I surfaced, they were stunned. They, they were literally stunned <laughs> so we walk i walk up to and i you know reach out to say hello and how you doing and immediately they grab my hand and they rub it trying to see if whatever's on my skin is going to fall come off uh, i don't know if they thought it was some kind of pain or grease or whatever but they're rubbing i mean everyone i touched everyone's hand i tried i extend my hand to was rubbing and trying to see if it came off well when they realized that i was one of them or I looked like one of them, they were amazed. And it was just a, a wonderful, wonderful meeting. Uh, I'll never forget that. And from that day on, uh, the Inuits and I became like family. Uh, they adopted me. I, I learned the, the language fluently. Uh, I was able to um, learn all the customs. And uh, I, I became a huge part of the community. I wasn't an outsider. I was a family. I was, it was family. It was absolutely family. So we want to fast forward real quick 
And we're going to go to the actual day that uh, Robert Perry and I made it to the North Pole. Well, we get to the North Pole. We're out, we're about like 100 miles outside of our destination. And uh, Robert, oh, at that time, well, now he's the Admiral now. So at that time, uh, Admiral Perry uh, is looking at his compass and he pulls out his notes and everything. And he realizes that we're like 100 and some odd miles outside of our destination. So the two of us, along with our two Inuits, we make track. I am the lead sled. And the lead sled is the one who actually paves the way and shows, uh, gives direction as to uh, for the rest of the team. So there I am taking off and uh, my Inuit and I get on a lead. Now, lead is a piece of ice that breaks off and just floats on the water. And because we are at the top of the world, uh, you'll get a lot of leads. You get a lot of ice. And because the the uh, the planet is constantly shifting. Your the ice can constantly breaks off. So there we are on this lead, and believe it or not, I slipped off and fell into the water. Well, I thought I was going. To, I thought I was going to die, and immediately my Inuit grabs my hand and pulls me up, and we make it to land. Uh, so now we are about forty some odd miles outside. We wait for Robert Perry to show up. Then Robert Perry shows up and he checks his sextant and he checks his, his charts and makes sure everything is all right and realizes that we're only like 40 some odd miles out. So he tells me to, you know, take off. We were going to make camp, but we decided that we were going, since we're so close, we're going to keep going. Well, I go off and I go just a few uh, we were supposed to go like 40 miles. Well, I went like 41, maybe 43, somewhere around there, about almost 50 miles, just a little further. And I was where, when I got there, I was there for about, oh, I would say mm, about 20 minutes to a half hour. Then Robert Perry shows up. And once he shows up, he takes out his charts and checks everything and realizes that we had made it. And Next thing I know, he pulls out his his uh, the flag and he, you know, posts it. And he and I are taking pictures and any of us thought we were crazy, but we are taking pictures because we we're taking pictures of the ice. <laughs> they didn't understand what we were doing. And next thing I know, um, we're on our way back and Robert Perry stopped talking to me. <laughs> I don't understand why. But uh, we make it back home and yeah, we make it back home. And once we, when we get home, um, we make it to New York. I'll never forget it. It was this huge parade. The president of the United States was there. Um, I, um, uh, uh, the president was there and it, some members of his cabinet, Congress was there, the governor of New York, the mayor, uh, there were reporters and just tons and tons of people. And Robert Perry goes up to the podium and he introduces everyone and thanks them, thanks everyone. And he forgot to mention my name. <laughs> I spent almost 18 to 20 years Trekking through that cold with that man. And on that day, he actually forgot who I was. <laughs> wow. Can you imagine, imagine a sharecropper son standing on the top of the world? I can, but I did it. I did it. Thank you. Wow, that was a really incredible story, Mr. Henson. Well, oh, thank you. Really amazing to hear about your experiences and all the adventures you had and all of the things that you saw. It must have been really amazing. Oh, it was. Oh, I wish I had more time. I would share, tell you so many more stories. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. <laughs> I have a few questions for you, if that's okay. Oh, please. Wonderful. So could you tell us how you manage the dog teams and the sleds? Oh, that's, oh, I love telling that story. Absolutely love telling that story. Well, uh, 
in order to get the dog sled set up, the first thing you do is you get a bunch of dogs and you put them in a huge room. And then what we would do was we would uh, throw out a piece of, we put a piece of meat out in, in the middle of the floor and you let them fight for it. And the last one standing will be the lead dog. You'll be the lead dog. And every now and then you'll get a female dog that wants to try to challenge the male dog. And uh, so, but she all, they always lose. So once you get the lead dog, now you have to harness them. So in order to harness them, you separate each dog and you pull one dog at a time. You give them a piece of frozen meat. And while they are trying to eat this meat, you are trying to put the harness on. So you can imagine <laughs> the, the scratches and the bites and the growl. You, you'll have this. So that's how you would harness the dogs. And uh, once you get them harnessed, then you you know then they're that you have complete control and you can um, guide them and direct them. They're they're absolutely once you get them harnessed, they are amazing. They're absolutely amazing. I love telling that story though. But thank you for asking. <laughs> Oh, that's so interesting here. It sounds like your adventures were varied on the path. Oh, very <laughs> much so. Oh, I'm just sure. curious. <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> oh, I know. I see from your coat, and I know you mentioned that it was very cold. But do you have a sense of what the temperature was? Was it the coldest you'd ever experienced? Ooh, for me, yes. Uh, sometimes uh, there were times when the temperature would drop below uh, 60 degrees below. There were many times. As a matter of fact, the closer to the top of the world uh, we traveled, the colder it got. And it was absolutely, you would have, uh, normally you would have a hood that would cover your face. Uh, you have special glasses that were made out of uh, the walrus bone that had just a little slit in it uh, that protected your eyes uh, because of the uh, the ice and the cold. And of course, you had uh, boots that were made out of uh, animal skin as well. There were certain boots that you had to wear. It was just the the attire was warm, very very comfortable uh, and heavy but it actually protected you. And um, so, yeah, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was something to behold. And let me say a, a very quick, very quick story. Uh, when we came back from our first expedition, Robert Perry needed to raise some money. So he had this great idea of uh, trying to come up with some ideas. So would you believe he actually had me wear the entire uh, regalia of the hat, the hood, the coat, the boots, the whole nine yards with a dog sled in the dogs in the middle of July, hustling through the streets of New York. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine how I was sweating in that outfit. <laughs> and we made it in and I would, the crowd would follow us right into the lecture hall and there I would be standing. I'd be sitting behind him with the dogs while he's lecturing, trying to raise the raise money and I was like oh lord I was I know I lost at least 10 15 pounds that day <laughs> but that awareness today let's kind of remind me of that story I thought I had to share that one I'm no good. thank you I, I imagine that specialized <laughs> equipment is not meant for New York summers <laughs> no it is not no it is not. actually it's not even um made for New York winter either <laughs> it's not oh and what type of food did they have on the expedition? What did you eat on the expedition? So what we did was we had dried um, walrus meat, uh, whatever. Uh, we had dried meat and we also had, uh, a lot of the food was dried. Uh, and it was, and the meat was, you needed the dried meat because it had a lot of nutrients in it. And that's actually what's going to save your life. So you wanted to make sure we had plenty of the dry, uh, the, the various types of meat, of the things that we had hunted. And, and of course, I did all the hunting, but uh, it was it, it, it was good. And there was just certain things. 
probably things that you probably wouldn't want to eat on a regular basis. But if you're out in that type of terrain and dealing with those type of climates, that's the food that you had to eat. That was the food that you had to eat. Very interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. I know I have learned so much today, Mr. Henson, and I really, really appreciate your taking the time to tell us your stories about your trip and your life and all of your experiences. Um, So I have one final question for you. Okay. What advice do you, as Matthew Henson, have for young people today? You know, when I was a young man, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I was determined, and as, as like the story, like I said earlier, I was determined that I was going to become the captain of my own ship and I was going to sail the world. Even though my dreams didn't fully get what I wanted, but I did do what was in my heart. So if there is something that is pressing on your mind that you want to do, go ahead and do it. Prepare yourself, work hard at it, and you will achieve it. And for those of us who deal with racism on a daily basis, uh, there, Captain Childs shared, uh, a, I, was having a, I was having problems with racism on the ship. And Captain Childs shared with me, he says, you know, Matthew, because of the color of your skin, you're going to come across many adversities or ignorance on a regular basis. And even just as a black man or as a woman, this applies to everyone. Instead of using this as your means of trying to get back and defend yourself, Captain Charles told me to use this. Intelligence will overcome ignorance any day. Instead of you fighting with your fists, use the gift that God has given you with your intelligence. Read, study the people that you come in contact with, study, learn as much as you can about the situation so that you can diffuse it with intelligence. Because they may not like you, but with your intelligence, they will have to respect you. And that's what you want. You want the respect. That's the best way to kill a bully is Mm -hmm. with knowledge. So if you you don't get anything, remember, you can overcome anything with hope, with faith in God and intelligence. Well, thank you so much. That's some great advice. Um, And now before we end our program today, let's take one last look at that Docs Teach educational activity related to Matthew Henson. And that's docsteach.org. So I hope everyone can join us on March 9th at 11 a.m. Eastern time to meet Julia Child, culinary wonder, who played an important role in communications with the U.S. Government Intelligence Agency, the OSS, during World War II. Thank you so much for participating in our program today.